had it set almost right, six inches. Well, maybe five. All right. Appreciate the men getting things ready for me. Appreciate Pastor Parsons continuing to let me be the Sunday school teacher here in the adult class. Appreciate you folks coming and good to see everyone uh, this morning. I was thinking about it there as I saw several come down celebrating anniversaries and birthdays. You know, the Lord's let me be here long enough to see a lot of folks come and go and some of them born and grow up. And uh, I was talking to Brother Cruz. We had his service yesterday. He went on to heaven and we uh, done quite a bit of talking the last uh, few weeks as we knew he was about to depart. And uh, I thought about it. He's on the other side now where he can see it all and understand like never before. Won't that be a time? I mean, I'd just like to keep in my own mind the history of the ministry and the work and the church and the people here. I pastored 50 years, and that's been almost three years since I retired. Can you believe that? I can't. Ah, but somebody said, would you do it again? Yes, but let's don't start it over again now. <laughs> in heaven, it'll be different. <laughs> I'll have a little more energy <laughs> then, maybe. But... Um, yeah, Brother Jeff well, can comprehend now. You know, down here we get part of it, but we can't get all of it, can we? And just can't quite comprehend it all. And uh, a big funeral service like yesterday, when I see people I have not, <clears throat> many of them out of town and come back for a funeral and see them and, and see kids that I remember around here as teenagers. Now they got six or seven kids or their own, and those kids have got kids. and. Uh, just an amazing, amazing thing to see. Well, open your Bibles to the book of John. We're, this is Sunday school class, so we study the Bible chapter by chapter, verse by verse. <clears throat> there is a difference in teaching from the Bible and preaching from the Bible. And both have their place and both ought to be used <clears throat> uh, in the church and in the ministry. If you want to learn your Bible, the best thing to do is bring it. <laughs> And we don't, uh, we don't study a Sunday school book per se, we study the Bible. <clears throat> so if you'd open it with us and go verse by verse, uh, God can show you a lot of stuff. You say, well, I didn't get it. Well, it may come back to you. You may have gotten more than you thought you got. I've heard the story of the <clears throat> wise man that told a young man working for him, he said, take this this sleeve or sift, what do you want to call it, down to the, and bring me back uh, some water. And he got back, by the time he got back, it was, it leaked all out. <clears throat> and uh, he said, well, go, go do it again. The young man looked at him, but he went and done it again. The time he got back, the water had lifted out, leaked out of it again. About the third time he got back, he said, I can't get the water back. It leaks out. What am I doing? He said, yeah, but look how clean the container is. <laughs> Sometimes the Word of God may go through you, but it does some cleansing on the way through. And uh, so it's good. Let's go to chapter 1 of the book of John. John's a great uh, book. Sometimes we call it the Gospel of John. Of course, it's the Gospel of Jesus Christ as God used John to write it. <clears throat> and it's a, it's a great book to share with people that need to understand the basics of the gospel. They need to understand how they can be saved by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. John is a great, <clears throat> great book for that. In fact, he, he told us, and it tells us the last two verses, I believe it is, of chapter 20, that these things are written that you may believe. And John deals a lot with the word believe. <clears throat> Some folks think, well, there's a difference in... Uh, in John and Paul's writings, no, there's not. John probably had the writings of Paul. He was the only one of the gospel uh, re recorders, such as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John is probably the only one that had the writings of Paul in front of him when he did the book. So that makes a difference. Of course, Paul explained the deep things of God, things like justification and sanctification and big words, very important words. <clears throat> but... Um, John simplifies it, and it comes down to this. One of the most well-known verses in the Word of God is, of course, John 3.16. 
For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever what believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. The key to salvation is still believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> There's no contradiction <clears throat> between John and Paul. Remember the story in Acts 16 where Paul and Silas was put in jail? You remember how they sang at midnight and the earthquake come and how the Philippian jailer got saved? <clears throat> remember what the Philippian jailer did when he, when he came and found the prisoners there and, and uh, the doors opened but they hadn't left and he'd, he'd been hearing the singing. I mean, uh, he, he was under conviction by the time of the earthquake come, I believe. But he asked the most important question in, in one of the clearest places in the Bible. He asked Paul and Silas, what shall I do to be saved? And what did Paul tell him? He didn't explain all of justification and sanctification. He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's simple. That's, that's just like John 3.16. So there's no contradiction between the plan, clear his throat in a minute maybe, between the plan of salvation given by John and the plan of salvation given by Paul. Uh, yes, we men sometimes don't carry all the things in our mind that we ought to, but the Bible don't contradict itself. Anytime you hear somebody says, well, the Bible says this in one place and that in another, uh, they're sure in their ignorance. It's not the Bible that's wrong. They're the ones that's wrong. The Bible says there is no private interpretation, which means if you take one verse and another verse and say these contradict each other, then your understanding is messed up. It doesn't. It complements. Sometimes it supplements. It adds to and gives you more detail on something, but it doesn't contradict. And we need not move into so many deep things. I, I feel like this last, I believe we're in the closing days. I believe Jesus could come any moment. In my own heart and mind, I don't see how he keeps waiting. I know he's long-suffering and merciful, not willing that any should perish, but it looks like the world, you, 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 can't, you can't keep up with the news of the day without wondering what are they going to do next? How bad? What else could they possibly do? And yet they find something to do worse. It is unbelievable. And yet the Lord is long-suffering. He don't want, because listen, it'll be like the door on the ark. When God shut the door, nobody else got in. And when the trumpet sounds and the saved go up, it's going to be hell on earth for a while under the Antichrist here. The door is going to be shut. The gospel door is going to be shut. <clears throat> in fact, even more than that, I ended with this last week saying this. Paul wrote to the Thessalonica church, and he said, During that time, for those that have rejected the gospel and are left behind, <clears throat> that even God is going to allow a strong delusion to be sent that they will be deceived by it. And he says, Because they believe not the truth. How many people have been in this building through the years and heard the truth but didn't accept it? Well, the truth is, the Bible says there'll come a time they'll be deceived. And the Antichrist will put his program into power. We see it now. We see the kingdom building. I had a question not too long ago from somebody. <clears throat> they said, where in the Bible does it teach the Antichrist is going to have a kingdom? I said, just pick your place. Because all the way through, that's what the warfare is about. Who's going to get the kingdom? Who's going to rule? And... Uh, Read the book of Daniel. The prophecy talks about the fellow that's called the little horn that shows up. The horn representing power. He's going to come to power. He's going to have a number of his name. We read in Revelation 13 about the 666 and the number you've got to have to buy or sell. All of that, <clears throat> that is building on us right now so big. And what we got in so-called politics in America is the warfare and the struggle is... They're the power, the group that's in power fear so much they're going to lose that. So they don't mind lying, deceiving, distorting, and doing these awful, awful things. You show on the news, I guess it was in New York, of course it's out in San Francisco and other places, showing all the people sleeping on the street with no restrooms and the 
piece of plastic tent or something <clears throat> and all that business and uh, in all the discussion and of course the liberals I call them that's too good a word for them they're just sorry fellas uh, but the liberals say this that and the other and somebody asked the question why don't they do something about it <clears throat> and this guy slipped up and said something I thought he said the truth and didn't know it he said well they see potential voters here don't that stink? <laughs> I mean, that's just ridiculous, isn't it? But uh, somehow or another, I mean, that, that's about, about the bottom line on it. Keep me in power by any way I can stay. And uh, I fear that's, that's it. But the Lord's going to come one of these days. He is long-suffering, but he's promised to come. Amen. Now, we're reading here in chapter 1 of John on the first coming of Christ. We start uh, verse 1 where it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word is Jesus, because verse 14 said the Word become flesh. <clears throat> and then we get into the subject of John the Baptist. John the Baptist was a forerunner, uh, preparing the people uh, for the Lord Jesus to come. It do you well to study a lot about John the Baptist, as a lot of folks got some really false ideas <clears throat> about him. But... Uh, he was chosen by God to do a job, and that was to be the forerunner and point to uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. You know that same plan is followed today. It's followed in political campaigns. Somebody comes to town, they're the forerunner, the candidate coming, they get things set up. <clears throat> that sort of thing uh, happens. That's, but the, the, John the Baptist is the forerunner who was predicted to come. Before we actually read a verse here in John, go with me to the last book of the Old Testament. That would be the book of Malachi. And uh, we'll, just before you get to Matthew in the New Testament, go to the last book of the Bible, book of Malachi. And I think I want to go to about verse three, uh, chapter 3. It's not a long book, of course, just four chapters. <clears throat> and... Uh, you turn to chapter 3, and it says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall pre prepare the way before me. And God is speaking here, and of course Jesus was God. It says, He'll prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek. And by the way, the Jewish Judaism, religion of Judaism, the Jews, they were, they were looking for the Messiah. Says he shall suddenly come, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant which he delight in. That was the covenant of Judaism made with the Jews there. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts, but who may abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand? When he appeareth, for he is like a refiner's fire. When you think of the blacksmith there, and the fuller's soap, there'll be some cleansing. You can get things clean, clean by soap, you can get things clean by fire. You ever seen somebody on the movies uh, burn the knife blade before they took the bullet out? <laughs> uh, sure, we understand that. Now, <clears throat> John the Baptist comes as the forerunner before Jesus comes. Now, there's two comings. He comes to his temple. You can read that. We won't turn to it, but you can read to it in Luke chapter 4. And then in the prophecy of Joel, and you find the day of the Lord when Jesus is coming. Now, understand something. When Jesus came, he did go into the temple. Remember the story how he turned over the money changers' tables and and uh, remember how he took a, made a cord, a little whip, and ran the money changers out of the temple? He came. They rejected him, no, no doubt about it. But he's coming back not to be offered and rejected again. But he's coming back as a cleansing fire, as a fuller soap. He's coming back. There's going to be a, a things made right and, and cleaned up, so to speak. Boy, what a job we need today on cleaning up. Amen. It's going to happen. Now go with me to the chapter of John, chapter, first chapter. 
And we'll start reading in verse 15 and read down here just a little bit. <clears throat> John 15 says, John bare witness of him and cried saying, this was he of whom I spake, speaking of Jesus. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Now somebody says, no, no, how could that be? He doesn't understand something, and I won't turn to it, but you could, you could find out that John was born six months before Jesus. You go over to chapter one of the book of Luke, six months difference. And uh, yet they were cousins, and you have the story over in Luke chapter 1 where the angel has come to Mary and told her about the birth of Jesus. And then Mary goes to visit Elizabeth, who was her cousin, right? And you ladies probably remember these verses well. When Mary came in, John the Baptist in the womb of Elizabeth, six months difference in their age now, <coughs> I, I won't say kicked, but he moved. <laughs> I've heard pregnant mothers say, he kicked me. <laughs> yeah. Amen, I'm sure that's real. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> we men wouldn't understand that. Closest we've been to that is probably a kidney stone, but <laughs> all joking aside, the baby recognized when Mary come in and the message she was talking with Elizabeth and John the Baptist was saying, amen, amen. I, I, that's, that's a little presumption on my part there, but he was recognizing the message that uh, Mary brought to Elizabeth. Now, here you have John the Baptist showing up and preaching to Israel to repent, baptizing out in the wilderness <clears throat> before he introduces Jesus. Now, we read a little bit further here. And John bare witness of him, cried, saying, This was him of whom I spake. He cometh after me, is preferred before me. See, that's a play on words, but it's a real truth there. Now get this, for he was before me. No, wait a minute, John, you're six months older. No, he's saying Jesus goes all the way back, all the way back, back to verse 1 in the beginning. <clears throat> he was God in the flesh, Jesus incarnate in the flesh. So John is saying, yeah, he's ahead of me. He's preferred before me. He was before me. And so the words here, and the words are important to understand as you, as you read and get, get the truth. Now it says in verse 16, and of his fullness have all we received. <clears throat> and grace for grace. Now you find John the Baptist shows up many times in the scripture. I don't know, I haven't counted them, but many times. Almost all the time, it'll say John the Baptist. New versions of your Bible, perverted versions, often will say John the Baptizer. Uh, King James Bible says John the Baptist. <clears throat> and look at verse 6 here in this chapter 1. And it says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. Now if you went over... Oh, your place here, and let's go back to the left, and we'll go over to Luke chapter 7, and pick it up in, oh, you can go with me, get there time I do. All right, Luke chapter 7, look at, sure hope I'm my mind, all right, yeah, Luke chapter 7, <clears throat> I want you to look at a few verses, we'll start. We'll start in verse 19 of Luke chapter 7. Read down two or three verses. Luke chapter 7, verse 19. <clears throat> and the disciples of John showed him of all these things. And John calling unto him two of his disciples sent them to Jesus, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? Now wait a minute. John, they won't call John the doubter. I don't think he was a doubter. The scribes and Pharisees of Judaism was preaching that two messiahs had to come. And all John is asking of Jesus is, are you the one? <laughs> See, there's prophecies in the Old Testament that the Jews knew that Jesus would be both a suffering servant 
and a king. So they figured one man can't be that, so it'll take two. They were wrong. Jesus was both. He did suffer and he will reign on, on, in his kingdom. So that's the question that John had his disciples come to Jesus. <clears throat> Jesus answers the question. But that's not my point. My point here in verse 20 is this. When the men were come unto him, they said, John Baptist. Wait a minute, where's the the? It's missing. Every other time you read in the scripture, it's John the Baptist, but here it's John Baptist. What was his name? His name was John Baptist. <laughs> That's verse six of chapter one we just left in, in John. Yes, he did baptize, but you read where John said, he that sent me to baptize, that was his mission. And uh, so his own disciples, personal disciples here, knew John well, and they go to speak to Jesus I want to know if you're the one, the only one, if you're going to fulfill all the prophecies. And they said, John Baptist. If his name had been Johnson, they'd have said John Johnson or John Smith. Anybody don't like that, you're messing with the wrong versions. That's what it says. The the was not left out accidentally. The the, the, the in the Greek is the definite article. And it was left out. Yes, he was a baptizer. He did preach repentance, but he was sent from God. There was a man sent from God. He was a lot like Jesus because his birth was foretold like Jesus. <clears throat> you remember he was named by the angel when Zacharias, his father, the priest, was serving in the temple. And his wife Elizabeth was past the age to conceive, and so when the angel showed up in the in the temple with with the priest Zacharias and told him, "You're going, your wife's going to get pregnant," he doubted, didn't he? You remember what happened to Zacharias in the, in there? He lost his voice, didn't he? He couldn't talk anymore when he come out. He was given signs and signals, and the people realized something had happened, but he couldn't talk. When did he get his voice back? when they went to name the baby. And they wanted to, the neighbors and the kinfolks and the friends, they're going to name him after his daddy. And Zacharias got his voice back then. See, he doubted and got in trouble with God and God stopped him from talking. First words he spoke was the very thing he doubted that got him in trouble. So when he spoke up, he said, no, his name is John. <laughs> That's what the angel told him in the temple. All right, so you're going astray. Now I just thought I wanted to share that with you. Come on back with me to John chapter one. <clears throat> By the way, that's the only time in the Bible his name is written that way, so you ought to mark that. The only, only time in the Bible, in the King James Bible, the Word of God, we, we know to be the Word of God. John says, before me, yet John was six months older in the flesh. And uh, then he makes a statement in verse 17 of John chapter 1. Um, For the law was given by Moses. But, that's one of the most important words in the Bible, B-U-T. <clears throat> John I'm sorry. Uh, Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is what? Death. But then what's the next word? But. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That word is a word that joins, a conjunction, and how important it is. Uh, wages of sin is death, but the gift of God. That's two real opposites. So when you see the word, but, you know you're crossing the street. You're going to the other side of the opposite truth there. But here in, in John chapter 1, grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Now, Moses was used of God to give the law and speak the law. And you remember the story that you read when they had come out of, um, the children of Israel had come out of Egypt. And I remember... Uh, 
Brother Earl Lee, you'd probably remember this. I don't see Scott. Yes, Scott is back there. Scott would remember this. So our first trip to Israel <coughs> back in the 70s. That's been a long time. <coughs> we were riding the tour bus and the guide up there speaking to us uh, as tourists seeing the sights. The old bus pulled up, a big old Mercedes bus, big old windshield in it. And he pulled up. We were in the hills around uh, the country there, the hills, and pulled up kind of the edge of the cliff. I remember my wife didn't like him getting so close to the cliff every now and then. There was another preacher's wife on there, Brother Hollowell's wife, remember? They didn't like it, and bus, they, you look out the window, and they're looking 200 foot down there, and they, they didn't like it too much. But anyway, he pulled up and stopped real close to the edge, and looking out the big windshield, you could see the mountains, and there's a mountain peak over here, and there's a mountain peak over here. Well, the guide, he knew we were a bunch of Christians supposed to know the Bible, so he liked to kind of play with us sometimes and ask us questions to try to stump us. And he did occasionally, I guess. But uh, on that particular thing, he said, okay, you Christians, tell us what, what, the, what you're looking at. These two mounts here, what are you looking at? And God gave me a quick response, and I said, Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. He said, how would you know that? I said, I read the Bible. <laughs> Well, that was the two mounts when the children of Israel were being led out of Egypt. Moses sent men up on the points of those two hills opposite each other. On one side, the men cried out the blessings of God if you obey him. On the other side, they cried out the judgment of God if you break those commandments. That's what was going on. Now, get this. <clears throat> The law came by Moses. Moses, God used to write the first five books of the Bible, which would include the law and include the Ten Commandments and so forth, Exodus chapter 20. So <clears throat> Moses gives them what you do to please God, what will bring the judgment of God on you. He gave them the two. That's still true today. God still honors them that honor him. You're still blessed more to obey God than to disobey Him. And so that's, that's still a universal truth. <clears throat> but uh, Moses is given credit for the law, but it was God's law. You remember how Moses stood before the burning bush. You remember how the Ten Commandments was given to him on Mount Sinai. And so Moses here says the law came by Moses, but grace and truth by Jesus Christ. Now the law says do this and live or don't do this and die. Grace comes by the Lord Jesus Christ, which says somebody else died for you. Somebody else provides you the grace. You couldn't keep the law. You can't be saved by keeping the law. No man has ever kept the law except Jesus. You can try, but if you're trusting your keeping of the law to get to heaven, you're not going to make it. Grace and truth, that's what we thank God for today, came by Jesus Christ. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. Jesus paid the price of the gift. We couldn't pay the price. And so, thank God that Jesus fulfilled the law and in our substitute, we fulfill the law, but we can't do it in ourself. Uh, think about the funeral yesterday. We asked Sister Clark to sing a powerful song there, Brother Cruz wanted. And it talked about Heaven's Gate and how you uh, come there and how you're going to get in and how the man saw himself unworthy and couldn't get in until he realized he could go in by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope there's been a time in your life you realize that. Personally, myself, I grew up this town and around common people like, and I heard all kind of rumors about the Bible, much of them not true. But 
I had the same idea that most folks do, and that is you've got to be good enough to go to heaven. It didn't take me long to realize I couldn't make it. <laughs> I didn't need nobody else to tell me I was bad. I knew I was bad. I couldn't make it. I remember mothers saying things like this, and she didn't have it right. She had a good heart. In a way, loved the Lord, but didn't know much about, about it. And she told us kids, my brother and I, to keep us straight. She had stories to keep us straight, threats. She was a psychiatrist and didn't know it. But we believed some of it because we were kids. And she said, she said, your sins now are upon me. I'll have to pay for them. But when you get 12 years old, your sin will be on you and you'll have to pay for it. That's not Bible. But she thought it was. She'd heard somebody else say it. You know what? They'd heard somebody else say it. And somebody else said it. It's amazing how things get distorted. But I believed it. And I was scared to become 12 years old. I'm not, not kidding you a bit. I remember I was living in that house behind the, the hotel. Still standing. We're still using it for down there. And uh, kind of ironic that... <laughs> church owns the house. The church I pastored bought the house. I still live in that house when I graduated 12th grade. But I didn't want to become 12 years old. Back then, poor folks had beds in every room. There was no such thing as the bedroom and this room, no, the living room. No, no, you had a bed in the living room too, if you, if you had a room. So I was sleeping in that front room, my brother and I, and I remember laying awake in bed that night, fearing to become 12. Now, I knew the time changed at midnight. So from midnight on, I decided I'd be perfect. I wouldn't sin no more. I wouldn't disobey no more. I wouldn't do no more wrong. What a joke. I did start off the day trying. But before the day was over, I knew the truth. I blew it. I hadn't made it. And I didn't see no other way. So when I walked into church at 22 years old, and heard a preacher say you can be saved by grace. It took me a while to understand. I'm, I must have come four times, three, four times. And I heard the preacher telling how you could be saved by grace, how you didn't deserve it, how, how Jesus paid for it, how he would give you the gift of eternal life. The best news I ever heard in my life. My, my first answer to that was, I don't deserve it. No, I don't. But Jesus paid for it anyway. And I didn't have it as a gift. You know, when somebody gives you a gift, they've already paid for it. It's not a gift if they give it to you with a price tag on it and say, I want this money back. That's the way some folks treat their religion. Jesus made the down payment, and then they make the payments. Trouble is, you can't make the first payment. <laughs> You've already been foreclosed on, if you think that. <laughs> the truth of the matter is, when I come in and heard that good news, Jesus Christ took my place. He loved me while I was yet a sinner and paid for my salvation, and I can receive it as a gift. I've never heard any news better than that. Amen. Never will. And uh, I hope you've come to that time. You've seen you couldn't pay for it yourself. You didn't deserve it. And you trusted Christ as your Savior and let him pay for it in your place. That's the only way you go into heaven, folks. Don't tell me I'm not good. Yes, I'm telling you what the Bible says. The Bible says there's none good. No, not one. None righteous. I believe the Bible. It was true about me. It's true about you. It's true about every man that's ever been born. We can't make it on our own. So Jesus loved us while we were yet sinners. And you know the good news? He said, whosoever will may come, and whosoever believeth shall not be ashamed. You know what whosoever means? Whosoever. <laughs> That's what it means. Don't have a name. Don't matter what side the tracks you were born on, who your daddy was, or how much money you got in the bank, it's whosoever will may come. Amen. All right, my time's up, Brother Smith. Okay, we're still in the summertime. When school starts, we're going to have the kids bring the parents back. 
749 on the number here this morning. Praise the Lord for that. Stay with us for the preaching service.